to the whole ABNY team uh, for hosting me. And uh, thank you also to LMHQ. Uh, it's really a great space uh, and an important piece of the economic development that's driving uh, the, the future of Lower Manhattan. Just a little background on me. Uh, I kind of came to economic development by accident. I, I had always planned to work in government um, and applied uh, to law school after banking with the idea that I would go into government. Um, but it ended up, like a lot of people in my law school class, working at a corporate law firm, as a matter of fact, right across the street. Um, after September 11th, uh, when my firm was forced to relocate from its offices, um, I thought to myself that if I'm ever going to do the public thing, that that, in fact, would be the time. So I started a search. Um, and I looked and I looked and finding nothing, uh, one fortuitous day, I uh, happened to go to lunch with a former colleague of mine uh, with whom I had worked when I uh, had worked in banking before law school. And uh, she suggested that I look at the EDC, which at the time uh, I hadn't even heard of. In the end, I, take, I ended up taking a job uh, at the Economic Development Corporation, um, and I'm embarrassed to admit that when I did so, I actually didn't even realize that economic development was a field. I just thought it was a two-word descriptor that happened to be in the name of the agency. But over time, what I came to realize was that, in fact, it's a field um, and an interesting one at that. So to understand why, what I wanted to do was dive into an explanation of, of what economic development is. And in the broadest sense, the goal of economic development is fairly well settled. And that is that it's the governmental function that seeks to expand the economy, create employment, and improve the general social well-being of people. What's less settled, though, is what strategies and tools best achieve these goals. And what I wanted to do is to use the bulk of my time this evening to offer some thoughts about what government generally does right and wrong when it comes to economic development, and then to spend the end of my time discussing, first, how New York City does economic development, and second, what the economic development challenges facing New York today are. So let's talk, start first with how economic development has, in recent decades, been practiced in most of America. Now, you might think that another way of framing this question is the following. What strategies do municipalities in the United States deploy to achieve their economic development goals? But there's a problem with this. And that is that it starts with a false premise. The false premise is that the approach taken by most American cities is actually strategic. In reality, the approach that the vast majority of American cities take historically, and, in, and that includes New York, by the way, has been anything but strategic and instead has been much more tactical. That is, rather than focusing on broad policies, municipalities have tended to be much more transactional. I'm a government and I'm seeking to lure company X to bring Y jobs with it to this jurisdiction. But as I'll explain in a minute, the result of this is that though the toolbox for economic development is actually quite expansive, for many in economic development, the number of tools that they actually deploy is quite limited. For example, take a look at uh, the home page for New Jersey's Economic Development Authority. And what you'll see here is a long list of tax incentive programs, and then a secondary layer of real estate opportunities, and essentially, that's it. There's, of course, an advantage to this kind of approach. For example, when a municipality is successful at luring a company, it makes for a nice headline. We won, they lost. And the deal represents an achievement that's often tangible, usually coming with a specific location in front of which an elected official, or more likely many elected officials, can stand and say, see this empty office space? Tomorrow it's going to be filled with 100, 200, 300 of your friends and neighbors earning juicy paychecks. There's a problem, though, with this approach. And that is, in my opinion, that it's both inefficient and ineffective. And to illustrate why, let me start by talking to you a little bit about the group that I worked for at EDC when I first was hired there. This group consisted of about 10 professionals who were responsible for administering New York City's tax incentive programs, spending months and months negotiating with companies over a headquarters or 300 jobs or something to that effect. So all that is good, except that even when we were successful, a deal like this, which incidentally didn't happen every day and in most cases didn't happen every month, barely moved the needle economically for New York. 
Not to mention the fact that to lock these deals down, we as government usually paid a substantial sum for the win. And on top of that, we also had to expend substantial additional resources to monitor our counterparty to ensure that we actually got the benefit of our bargain. In other words, we spent a lot of time and a lot of effort to get what? Even assuming we were talking about 1,000 jobs, which, by the way, was rare, for New York City, an economy with 4 million jobs, this represented an increase of 0.25% in our total employment. Which is, by the way, not to say that it's never a place, there's never a place for this kind of transaction. There are places where a specific deal with a specific company can prime the pump and get economic activity flowing without further governmental assistance. But it is to say, at least in my opinion, that municipalities make a mistake when they make this their primary approach to economic development. So that raises another question. What is the right answer? My take is that if a municipality really wants to be successful at economic development, it has to think strategically. In other words, the focus of municipalities should be less on this company or these jobs and should instead be more on creating the conditions that are generally favorable for the attraction of companies and the creation of jobs. Why? Well, for one, it leverages the, the work of government. After all, which is better, focusing on one division of one company or making your city so desirable that your city is on the short list of every division of every company? Additionally, a more strategic approach takes government out of the business of picking winners and losers. And not just winners and losers in specific, among specific companies, predicting, for example, in 2005 that BlackBerry would cease to be a major tech player within 10 years. How is government supposed to do that? but also winners and losers among industries. How many cities are trying to be the next Silicon Valley? How many cities are trying to be the next great biotech center? The problem with a company-specific or industry-specific approach to economic development is twofold. One, there are reasons why places are successful in certain industries, not all of which are known or even knowable by people in government. And two, there may be companies or industries that could present future opportunities for a municipality that nobody knows about today. In short, when municipalities are tactical rather than strategic, there's a good chance that instead of chasing the next big thing, these municipalities will end up in fact missing it, or even worse, chasing the last big thing. Which brings us to another important question. What conditions are generally favorable to the attraction of companies and the creation of jobs? Likely, everyone who practices in economic development will give you a different answer. However, what I've observed in my decade plus of doing this kind of work is the following. The recipe, first and foremost, starts with people. If your municipality creates or attracts the best and the brightest, those people will both create businesses on their own and attract businesses that are looking to tap into their expertise. This means that an important part of economic development should be investing in education to provide people with the skills demanded by the marketplace, both at the primary and secondary levels and increasingly at the post-secondary level. It also means that an important part of economic development should focus on making your municipality a magnet for those educated in other places. This requires a laser-like focus on quality of life, including investments in public safety and investments in what I like to call magnetic infrastructure. Those are the sorts of things that make a place worth living in. Some of this, obviously, is within a city's control, things like promoting arts and culture or creating new open space. But some of it isn't, like the weather or federal immigration policy. And that can be a challenge to deal with at times. Which brings us to the second key ingredient for successful economic development, namely a thriving entrepreneurial scene. The reason for this is the following. If a municipality is successful at retaining and attracting the best and the brightest, the combination of this productive workforce and a high rate of new business creation should yield a high probability that the local workforce will stumble on the business models and industries that are best suited to the municipality. In other words, instead of asking government to guess at, as to what a municipality's competitive strengths are, or even more difficult, what they could be, it puts the power in the hands of the municipality's greatest asset, and that is its people. 
leaving it up to the market to sort the answer out. Now, this doesn't mean that government has no role to play in promoting entrepreneurship. As mentioned, it certainly has a role to play in bringing the best and the brightest. And especially if the startup scene is not robust, it also has a role to play in addressing market failures, including pursuing a reduction in regulation, the creation of low-cost space, offering new resources as seed capital, and helping to create training programs to create expertise among prospective entrepreneurs. And this brings us to the third ingredient for successful economic development, and that is robust and modern infrastructure. And here I want to pause to explain two important things about infrastructure. First, the infrastructure that's relevant to the economic well-being of a jurisdiction runs the gamut. It includes private infrastructure, housing, commercial space, both of which are impacted by government in multiple ways. And it includes basic infrastructure, the stuff that makes a modern city work, like sewers and water systems, as well as communications, connect connectivity, and of course, transportation. And this brings me to my second point about infrastructure, namely that of all of the forms of infrastructure, perhaps none is more important for economic development than transportation. Why is that? Because transportation not only ensures that people and goods can move around in and out of a jurisdiction efficiently, but also because transportation provides a, re a necessary relief valve for growth. And what I mean by this is that when a municipality does economic development correctly, it creates a virtuous cycle whereby people attract economic activity, which attracts more people, and so on. The challenge of this, though, is that as demand rises, it's hard to keep pace on the supply side. That is, it's hard to keep squeezing more and more people, jobs, etc., into the same space. This challenge, though, can be mitigated by transportation which allows people to spread over a larger area without being farther apart, at least as far as time measures distance, which in turn relieves local pricing pressure, keeping the region affordable. OK, so a lot of theory so far. But what about economic development in New York City? How do we do it? And what are our major challenges today? In the few minutes I have left, I'm going to take each of these questions in turn. So first, with respect to how we do economic development in New York City, the primary vehicle is the city's Economic Development Corporation. Now, structurally, EDC straddles the line between the public and the private sectors, a structure that is, I think, fairly unique, if not entirely unique, among major cities in the country. Its predecessors actually go back further, but modern EDC was officially founded during the administration of Mayor Dinkins. And the concept was to combine the functions of several existing city agencies into one entity. But what's interesting is that rather than making that new entity a city agency, the entity was instead structured as a quasi-independent not-for-profit operating under an annual contract with the city government. In essence, admitting that the city's own rules made it difficult for the city to do economic development effectively. So what are the benefits of not being a city agency to EDC? There are actually many, but I think the most important are the following. One, unlike city agencies, EDC is not unionized. And that means that it can hire and fire with relative ease, which in turn means that it tends to have a less bureaucratic workforce. EDC also isn't subject to the city's procurement rules, meaning that it can work with the private sector more easily and more flexibly. And in my opinion, most importantly, EDC was created with a very different revenue model from city agencies. Specifically, it generates its own revenues from its own business operations. This means that it actually is operating in the economy, giving its staff real-time exposure to business conditions. It also means that EDC doesn't rely on, city, on the city council to fund its operations. In fact, EDC is a net contributor to the city's budget, insulating EDC from politics and ordinary budgetary pressures. Now, as far as where these operating revenues come from, which total about $200 million every year, they're mainly derived from a combination of the sale of surplus land that the city deeds to EDC to put into productive use, as well as from income generated from properties that EDC manages, properties like the Hunts Point Food Distribution Center and the Brooklyn Army Terminal. Now, with respect to governance, 
EDC, which employs over 400 people, has its own independent board, though a majority of that board is appointed by the mayor, and the mayor essentially appoints its, pre its president. So to put it a different way, it's independent, but only up to a point. Now, what are EDC's responsibilities? Well, they've evolved over time. At EDC's core, not surprisingly, can be found an economic development agency with functions that would be recognized in cities across the country. These include, as I described a minute ago, real estate related activities ranging from property management to land sales. They also include EDC's management of New York City's primary vehicle for corporate retention and attraction, the Industrial Development Agency. Now, just to add another layer of complication to this whole story, the IDA is actually a separate state-created entity that, pursuant to its charter, has the power to abate real estate taxes, sales taxes, and mortgage recording taxes, and to issue tax-exempt debt. EDC provides staffing to the IDA, and the president of EDC, by tradition, serves simultaneously as the chairman of the IDA. Now, in the past, the IDA was primarily known for giving tax incentives to large corporations to get them to move to New York or to stay here. But under the last two mayors, under current Mayor de Blasio and, and Mayor Bloomberg, there's been much less of this kind of activity with the IDA primarily focused on not-for-profits and industrial businesses and under Mayor Bloomberg on financing special projects like the seven-line extension to Hudson Yards and Yankee Stadium and City, City Field. Now, beyond these core economic development functions, EDC also has a range of other responsibilities, all of which have been appended to EDC's mission as it has over time proved its effectiveness. For example, today, EDC is responsible for a $2 billion plus dollar capital budget, with EDC managing complex projects for various city agencies, ranging from post-Sandy reconstruction in the Rockaways to sewer projects for the Department of Environmental Protection in Coney Island. EDC's expanded responsibilities also include working on area-wide rezonings, which EDC traditionally undertakes in conjunction with the Department of City Planning in places like Far Rockaway or Willits Point, which you see on the screen. And in more recent years, EDC's expanded responsibilities have also included an internal strategic consulting function that analyzes sectors of the economy closely and develops policies that are meant to address deficiencies over the long term, with the best example being Mayor Bloomberg's applied science competition that ultimately created the $2 billion campus that Cornell and the Technion are building on Roosevelt Island. But to say that the sum total of New York City's economic development activities are carried out by EDC is to miss the broader point that I was making earlier about economic development, namely that to do economic development right municipalities have to think and act expansively. In this way, New York City's economic development activities involve numerous entities beyond EDC. For example, they include partners in the private sector and grassroots organizations. They also include, of course, other city agencies, LDCs, local development corporations with specific responsibilities like the LDC that runs the Brooklyn Navy Yard, the Department of City Planning, the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, agencies like Parks and Cultural Affairs, Department of Transportation, and the list goes on. Elected officials are another important participant in the whole process of economic development, from members of the city council and community boards to the borough presidents. And finally, at least before the great Cuomo de Blasio feud of the last year, economic development in New York City also frequently involved partnership between city and state agencies, including the MTA, the Port Authority, and the Empire State Development Corporation. And this brings me to the last section of my remarks today, namely, what do I view as New York City's most pressing economic development needs at present? And here, I think it's worth noting that these needs are actually quite different from the needs from 10 years ago and certainly those from 30 years ago, which illustrates another important point about economic development. And that is that like cities, economic development policies have to change over time to adjust to new realities. So while in the 1970s and 1980s, we lived in a city that was in free fall, bleeding businesses and people, both of which were fleeing high crime and crumbling infrastructure. And while in the early 2000s, we lived in a city that was dealing with a series of existential crises from 9-11 to the Great Recession to Hurricane Sandy, 
Today, our major challenge is that we are almost succeeding too well. We have so many people who want to live here with population at record levels. We have so many businesses that want to hire here with employment at record levels. We have so many people that want to visit here with visitorship at record levels, that our infrastructure is creaking and our supply of the space needed for all of these activities, especially residential and commercial space, is failing to keep pace with demand, thereby driving up costs. This situation, of course, is both good and bad for New York. It's good because to the extent that we have problems, that is, overburdened infrastructure and affordability crisis, the problems are symptoms of our underlying strengths and not of any sort of underlying fundamental weakness. But on the other hand, of course, it's bad because even if they're symptomatic of our success, the problems are real and if unaddressed, could overwhelm the virtuous economic cycle that we've been living in in recent years. So given this, what should the thrust of our economic development policy be? In my opinion, it should be the following. First, we can't take for granted our city's underlying success. This means, most importantly, continuing to improve the quality of our workforce, seeking to attract and retain the best and the brightest by maintaining and even improving our quality of life. And by the way, the most important thing we can do to maintain our quality of life, it might not be what you think. I would argue that it's fiscal discipline. The reason for this is that New York City's revenues tend to exaggerate the economic cycle. As a result, when times get rough in the larger economy, New York City's fiscal picture gets dire. The dirty little secret of New York City's budget is that the mayor actually controls a relatively modest percentage of it, with the rest made up of uncontrollable expenses from debt service to pensions. So, when the mayor is faced with a 10% budget gap, by way of example, it requires something more like a 20% cut of the portion of the budget that he controls, which also happens to be the portion of the budget that most impacts quality of life. Schools, parks, sanitation, police, etc. And as we learned in the 1970s, when this portion of the budget gets slashed, the virtuous cycle turns ugly quickly, with turnaround very challenging, requiring billions of dollars and decades of hard work to reverse. And what about the negative symptoms of our otherwise positive overall situation, especially our affordability challenge? How do we address this? The answer, I think, is multi-layered. Overall, we need to ensure that we're producing enough new space, both residential and commercial, to meet growing demand, putting a lid on cost increases or even driving costs down. Now, this may sound intuitive, but it's not the way that many in government have traditionally attacked this problem, focusing instead more on things like rent regulation than on the fundamental supply and demand imbalance. Which, by the way, is not to say that there's no place for rent regulation. However, in a world of limited government resources and subsidies, I believe that we should be targeting these programs at those most in need, namely the very poor, as opposed to the middle and working classes who are by far their largest beneficiaries today. We also need to continue to invest aggressively in our infrastructure. Doing so not only keeps the city functioning, but especially when it comes to transit, as mentioned earlier, it provides that safety valve that we need to allow us to accommodate population over a lower area, lowering costs for all, while also creating generally high paying construction jobs for modestly credentialed workers. And speaking of jobs, the final piece of the puzzle involves exactly that. Because affordability is not just about the cost of housing or indeed about costs at all but in fact is about the ratio of costs to incomes. Accordingly, the city government needs to focus aggressively on the production of jobs, especially those jobs that the economy is not on its own producing, well-paying jobs for low-skilled individuals. So we need to work to raise the skill levels and therefore the income potential of our lowest skilled residents through better education while also working to attract and retain the types of industries that traditionally employ lower skilled workers at higher wages, even if government has to pay to bring them here. So pretty simple, well, not, but 
It's not rocket science. And the good news for us as New Yorkers is that by many measures, our city has never been functioning at a higher level than it is today. However, there's nothing preordained about this condition. In fact, as any student of New York history will tell you, New York has gone quickly from paradise found to paradise lost at various times throughout its history. And for this reason, we as citizens need to pay very close attention to how our leaders approach the important issue of economic development. It may be more art than science, but I hope you'll agree after this presentation that it's nonetheless critical to our collective success. Thank you.